Alright, so hello and welcome to this episode of T-Tech. So I want to say out front here that this is going to be more of an explainer type video. And I'm going to show you and walk you through my first exposure to FreeBSD in the context of uh, firewalls and um, network security and things of that nature. So originally the first one I had exposure to was FreeBSD 6.1. And I've basically, that configuration from back then, back in 2006, I've moved it forward and basically copied it onto a FreeBSD 12.2 system. And I want to go ahead and talk about some things about the configuration. So I've already actually pre-configured everything. The only thing I've done different compared to back then um, was how this this was not set up by myself, but it was uh, set up by a good friend. All right, this time anyway, I set the unbound DNS server up on this, whereas before it didn't run that. But essentially, in user local etsy dhcpd.conf, I just set up a basic uh, DHCP scope and everything. All right, and then user local etsy unbound unbound conf just change some basic configurations and you know then again you you always have the option of the other things that unbound is capable of there but other than those two things the rest of the configuration takes place in Etsy rc.conf now I've also set up uh, Etsy SSH SSH D and uh, basically changed the port and things of that nature and other things like that. And nowadays, port scanners scan around and find open ports, so, you know, I'm not worried about that. They're going to find it anyway. <coughs> but uh, in here, if, let's actually use Vi, maybe that'll be a little bit better to see. There we go. And uh, now I can highlight what I'm talking about. So with uh, syslog here, I've essentially shut off the logging socket. Now that was not there originally on the first stop build. So there's actually been things added in FreeBSD since um, you know the first firewall ever worked on with it um, to make it even more secure. So um, that's the interesting thing about you know open source and the BSDs and everything. You know things improve over time, and it's cool to be able to witness that. But um, <clears throat> we don't have send mail enabled. We're not relaying mail through it. But I will say, you can still get um, your reports and things of that nature. Set the host name, we have a SSH enabled, the DHCP server is enabled, unbound, NTP date, um, the pool for North America. We have our interfaces here, and originally I didn't have this uh, sys0 interface. It was originally just sys0 and xl0, because originally, you know, this is 100 megabit interfaces, and it's been upgraded now, you know, 4 gigabit. Some of them I'm still using 100 megabit, but... You know, just to give you an idea how these things can go forward with you. And this was DHCP before, so instead of this address, it just had DHCP there. And it's a router. The firewall type open, the uh, firewall enable, yes, and firewall type open. This is, this enables IPFW, that's the IP uh, firewall in FreeBSD. And open essentially assigns it a rule set that allows all packets um, any source, any destination, any protocol, any interface. Yes, that is not what I say in you know my other t uh, other times when I'm talking about PF and I'm saying, hey, you want to do a block drop all first. You know, you want to you want to have it very restrictive. Well, this case was not like that in this uh, instance. It was just configured in this way where it was open. Because in this case, the firewall could be used to block things going out is what it would have been meant for in this configuration. If it's coming in, it's already reached this machine. But now, very interesting, and I have not dealt with NatD in a while. It was fun to make this, uh, to remake this and, and, you know, go back and remember this. I, I had kind of forgotten about this program. But NatD is a user land um, network address translation daemon. So when we do NAT, you, now in PF, you know, PF has built-in network address translation. But that wasn't always the case, and NATD um, actually sat 
as a pr daemon and was passed packets, and we'll see that in a second, uh, up to itself, like from the network stack and changes the address of them and everything. And it would change the address with NATD interface to EM0. And then these are the flags, and what dash M means in my case is that I'm not changing the source port when it NATs traffic. This helps with things, protocols like RPC. So you can um, have those operate a little bit better through the firewall. And then the dash F is the configuration file. This is where we can add extra things like redirecting ports and things of that nature, our port forwards, so our destination NAT. And the current uh, secure level enable enables uh, security levels, and security level 3 restricts the FreeBSD kernel from accepting modules being loaded into it, as well as writes to uh, character devices such as dev memory and dev kmem and things of that nature. Additionally, it stops you from flushing the rules or adding new firewall rules in any of the firewalls, by the way, whether it's IPF, uh, the IPF firewall, the IPFW firewall, or PF, the kernel secure level 3 stops those things from happening. Now, login vein is actually a pretty advanced option. And what this actually does is, remember how I always say when uh, traffic hits a port, you can sometimes, if you don't have a firewall, get a reply. Well, in this case, with an open firewall policy, that is happening. But this is what's called a bastion host, or a very secure host, that runs a very small set of network services. So being in this case, it's a router, but it's not running everything under the sun to be attacked. So we're not really that concerned about traffic going directly to it. And login vein helps us actually see all that traffic. So um, that's what we're able to see there. So, for instance, if I was to send a packet to port 80 on this machine, if we look at Netstat, there is nothing listening on port 80. So that would actually be logged in the kernel's ring buffer, and you could see it with dmessage, and it would actually show you that, uh, you know, right from the console. But um, that's very helpful for analyzing things like maybe it's a port scan coming in, and... This is more from an, like an, being an analyst into your network traffic, being able to really pick apart what's going on. Now, this is also why programs like Snort are important, and like Sericata. But being able to really step through it with things like TCP dump, which we can do on this, and other things like that, are very important. And that's why login vein is used. So essentially, though, like if I do IPFW show, because that's what those two RC comp variables enabled, we have a rule here that diverts 8668, so IP packets, I'm sorry about that, IP packets that are version 4, coming from any source to any destination on the EM1 interface, we're going to divert those to 8668. And then toward the bottom here, we're allowing some ICMP, or some IP, IPv6, and other things of that nature. And then we're allowing everything else by default. But as I said, the, the NAT will prevent routing from the WAN to the LAN on the internal side because of how that would operate. Because essentially, you have... You wouldn't have a way to get back to these addresses without a port forward in the natd.com file. So, <clears throat> um, we have that there though, and um, the next thing I will show you is <clears throat> the natd. So, if we look at natstat, that 8668 is a, a divert socket for IPv4, and this is just another way to perform nat. But if we look at top, we can see NATD is there and listening. So it just will come up, change that traffic, and then it re-injects it into the network stack, and then it, the IP routing will take place and everything else. But you want to remember, when you're using a NATD program, the NATD program, 
the packet goes all the way to layer 7 and on all the way back down to layer 3 and 2 and, and 1 and so on. So it has to go all the way up, be natted at layer 7 so to operate on the layer 3 headers and then be sent out. Now this can lead to bottlenecks and things of that nature but it just depends on the hardware you're running it on. But essentially though that is how this machine is was uh, configured and I took the config from 2006, brought it forward, it still works surprisingly um, and before we finish up, I do want to let you know, you um, can do this today, and it works. I'm actually, you know, using this at, at the moment on one of my firewalls. But, what you need to know is that there's actually a more efficient way to do NAT. So, basically, the kernel module just sits in the kernel, so it would sit here and then it would do NAT quicker than what we're able to do with NAT D firewall because you have to remember um, with this firewall I had three interfaces there remember um, packets can route between any of them there's no rules here preventing that traffic so when you use an open firewall policy like we have here you don't have um, network segmentation you just have kind of free reign between any of the interfaces so the, the, the machine itself is secure with a secure level as well as um, you, we have a little more visibility with the login vein variable and I'll actually show you that to finish up. What those actually set from that file are these and the sets TCP and UDP and just, just basically says hey someone tried to connect to that port but there's nothing there listening. All right, and you, if you want to um, find out about that, if you man TCP, search for vein, you can see login vein, you could read all about it there. So, because there's different values and things. But uh, with that, uh, I do hope you found this helpful. But you can actually still implement this today, and I think it's really cool, in my opinion. So, with that, uh, I do hope you enjoyed this episode. I know it was a little bit different, but uh, so anyway, as always, you know. Tyler with T-Tech, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you for watching.